well, this, uh, I think, you know, I don't know if there's anyone who doesn't know the hymn, you know, Amazing Grace. Um, and, uh, but this, this, this hymn that we just sang, it really has a lot to do with what we're talking about this morning. All right? And uh, let me just step back to review kind of what we covered last week. This is the second of our, in our series. And as you can see from the, from the title on your sheet, the title is The Life and Letters of the Apostle Paul. Okay, the life and letters of the Apostle Paul. So first, um, what is an apostle? We, we just mentioned this last week. We'll get into this more later. But an apostle is simply one who is sent by God, one who speaks the gospel to other people, one who um, teaches the truth, and one who raises up churches, okay? So, and uh, besides the 12 apostles, you know, who were originally the 12 disciples, there are other apostles, such as the Apostle Paul, uh, Barnabas, Epaphroditus. There are different ones mentioned in the Bible. But it just means one who's sent by God to speak to others about the Lord, okay, in a very simple way. Then, who is Paul? Uh, originally, he was Saul. He was, uh, let me, I, I want to read these verses to you, which, which Ben read last week. This is 1 Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14. All right, it says, this is the Apostle Paul, he's writing, and he's talking about himself. He says, who formerly was a blasphemer and a persecutor and an insulting person. But I was shown mercy because being ignorant, I acted in unbelief. And then listen to this. This is verse 14. And the grace of our Lord superabounded with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay, so there he was. Who was he? Blasphemer, persecutor, and insulting person. But the grace of our Lord superabounded with faith and love in Christ Jesus. So that's his testimony. That's the Apostle Paul's testimony. He considered himself uh, in... Verse 15, he considered himself the foremost of sinners. The foremost. You know, there's sinners. There are sinners who are worse than others. But in the apostle's mind, you know, before he received the Lord, he considered himself the foremost of those. So that's why grace didn't just abound, but it superabounded uh, in his testimony. So that's why we sang that song. Because it actually has very much to do with what we're talking about this morning. Now, last week... We started not with Saul's birth, not with just his background, but the title of last week was, was Chosen Vessel, a chosen vessel. All right, that comes from Acts 9.15, this term where Paul, or, you know, there's this phrase that Paul was a chosen vessel. He was chosen even before he was born. All right, he was a chosen vessel. So, uh, and, and it's the same with us, um, us who know the Lord. We were, we were chosen even before God laid the foundations of the earth. Um, okay, so he was chosen, and then it's secondly, it mentions this really interesting term. You would think a chosen person, a chosen, you know, uh, yeah, apostle. But it mentions a really interesting, it says a chosen vessel, a chosen vessel. And what is a vessel? A vessel is, it's a container. Uh, last week, we used the illustration of a glove, a glove made in the shape of a hand. It's, it was made to do what? To contain the hand. That was why it was made. And likewise, in the Bible, it says that we were made in God's image, and it also uses this term vessel. And why? A vessel can be used for many things, but its purpose is to contain something. Uh, a Coke bottle was made to contain Coke. A glove was made to contain a hand. Uh, I could use a Coke bottle to prop up my bookshelf, to do a lot of things, but it was made to contain Coke. And likewise, Paul, all of us actually, we were vessels created to contain what? We can try and fill ourselves with a lot of things, education, money, pleasure, all these things. But we were designed actually to create only one thing, and that is God himself. All right. All right, so that was just, uh, that was what we covered last week. Now we want to move on. This week, the title of our our fellowship, our meeting, is From Persecutor to Pursuer. From Persecutor to Pursuer. And I want to just step back a little bit. All right. Saul, 
which is Paul's name before he was converted. Okay, Saul was he was he was not a small. I mean, he was he was a top guy in the Jewish religion. Okay, there are different portions of the Bible until he he describes himself. Uh, he was born as a Hebrew. He was born as a Hebrew. As to the law, he was a Pharisee. Okay, and he he himself said he considered himself according to the righteousness in the law. He was blameless. Now that that's not an easy thing to say. Another another thing the Bible says is that Saul, this person, was trained at the feet of Gamaliel. All right, Gamaliel. If you look at the book of Acts, was not just a Pharisee, but he was a Pharisee in a special council called the Sanhedrin. And not only was he a Pharisee in the Sanhedrin, but he actually, if you look at the way the Sanhedrin worked, he was kind of like the director. He was like directing how things were going. All right, so Gamaliel was like way up there. And who was Saul trained by? He was trained by that guy. That was his mentor. That was his, that's where he was trained. So he was on his way up. I mean, he was probably, you know, the, he had the bright future. Uh, they were looking to him. But, uh, then, okay, then, then let's come to the Word, okay? These verses that are printed on your sheet. Acts 9, 1 through 5. Okay, let, let me uh, read this, but as I read, just consider this, okay? It says, But Saul, still breathing, threatening and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to Damascus for the synagogues, so that if he found any who were of the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Okay, this guy is intense. I want you to pick up on the intensity of what he's doing. Okay, he is not just speaking or not just act, not just, you know, not just, not just threatening and, and not just being part of murder, but he is breathing it, okay? You, you don't breathe something if it's not, like, really, really in you, okay? I can go out and talk about a lot of different things, do things, but what do I breathe, all right? That means that's at the core of my being. So he was, what was he breathing? It wasn't love and mercy. He was breathing <laughs> threatening and murder. Okay, then... Check this out, okay? In, in, this is not printed on your sheet, but in Acts chapter 8, I want to read you the amplified version of Acts 8, 1 through 3. This is what it says. And Saul was not only consenting to Stephen's death, he was pleased and entirely approving. On that day, a great, uh, a great and severe persecution broke out against the church, which was in Jerusalem. Okay, I'm going to skip. Uh, to verse 3. But Saul shamefully treated and laid waste the church continuously with cruelty and violence. And entering house after house, he dragged out wow. men and women and committed them to prison. All right, this is very intense, all right? You go into someone's house, you know, maybe they're kicking and screaming, just, and not just the guys either, but the women, just, you know, drag them away, all right? Okay, then, then check out the next verse on your sheet there. Let's read this together. This is Galatians 1.13. Let's read it all together out loud. For you have heard of my manner of life formerly in Judaism, that I persecuted the church of God excessively and ravaged it. All right, so again, it doesn't just say I persecuted the church of God, but I persecuted the church of God excessively and Ravaged it. Okay, ravage means you just, it just means to wreak havoc, to do ruinous damage. All right, so this is, this is what he was doing. He was, he was not just, you know, sitting by, but he was intensely, intensely persecuting. All right, then what happens? Okay, this very interesting encounter. Now it's important to okay, keep this intensity in mind. We're going to come back to this. Continue with the story in Acts 9, all right, it says, And as he went, he drew near to Damascus, and suddenly a light, a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
all right? So imagine if you're salt, you're, you've been doing severe damage, ruinous damage to the church, and of course there's a light, and then there's a question, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What would, how would you respond? What would you say? All right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, if it was me, I would, I would have answered the question. I would have said, because these people are, you know, defacing the Jewish religion. They are going against what's written in the Holy Scriptures. They are, you know, I, I would have been, you know, okay, this is what, why are you persecuting me? I'll tell you why. Because, you know, but... But, uh, but it's very interesting, he, he actually, he didn't answer the question, alright? What did he do? He asked another question, okay? And this question is very, very significant. And the question that he asked, as you can see there, and he said, who are you, Lord? Alright? Uh, and he could have asked, even if he did ask a question, he could have asked different questions, like, why are you, why are you doing this to me? Or... What, what's, what's going on here? What? But, um, but it's very significant, okay? The question that he asked wasn't, and a lot of times it's, okay, we, we might be in, you know, going through our life, whatever. We might get knocked down sometimes, circumstances. Uh, a lot of times we just say, why? Lord, why is this happening to me? Lord, please. Um, but actually, the question we should ask is the same question that Paul asked here, Saul, and that is, who are you, Lord? All right, who are you, Lord? This is his first personal interaction with the Lord. And it was a question. Then, of course, came the answer. And he said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. All right. In Matthew 21 and 22, there was a bunch of, uh, you know, people in the Jewish religion, all different kinds, lawyers, Pharisees, they were, they were asking the Lord Jesus a bunch of questions. All right? They were, they were putting him on the spot. They were trying to catch him to see if they could, you know, get him to slip. All right, do you remember what those questions were? Okay. The, fir the first question is, by what authority do you do these things? Or who gave you this authority? You know, he was doing miracles. So, uh, this question, it was related to religion. All right? So, there was a question... They're asking it was related to religion, all right? Who gave you? Who who ordained you? All right? Who authorized you to be doing these things? All right? Secondly, there's another question asked. I think many of us remember this question. Uh, it's related to taxes, all right? So they asked him a question. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? All right? So now they're asking about politics. So first they asked about religion. Secondly, they asked about politics, all right? The government... So they had this question, right? Then third, there was another question from the Sadducees. And uh, they asked another question about, you know, say there was seven brothers and the first guy married a woman, then he died, so the second one married her, then he died, then the third guy married her, then he died, etc. Uh, in the resurrection, whose wife will she, will, will she be? Um, so this was, a, this was a question about belief about theology, you could say. Uh, what they're really saying is, do you really think there's such thing as resurrection? Um, but it's a question about belief, all right? Then there was another question. It was actually a pretty good question. But uh, this was asked by a lawyer. He said, what is the great commandment in the law? What is the great commandment in the law? So it was a question about religion, politics, belief, and the law. Eh, you know, at least, you know, they weren't asking about sinful things. But then the Lord Jesus asked them a question, all right? And they couldn't answer it. He answered all their questions about all of these different areas. Then he asked them a question, all right? And what was the question that he asked them? Do you remember? <laughs> he said, what do you think concerning the Christ? Whose son is he? All right? That's, that's the question of questions, all right? This is the most important question in the universe someone can ask is, what do you think concerning the Lord Jesus? Alright, it's the same question that Saul was asking here.
who are you, Lord? So we can ask a lot of questions. We can ask a question about religion, a question about politics. But this is the question of questions, okay? We all need to ask this question. Every human being needs to ask and find the answer to this question. And that is, who are you, Lord? What do you think concerning the Christ? All right, now, just for a little uh, chronology, all right? Now, so, the, uh, you could, the Lord Jesus was crucified in the early, you know, after AD 30, somewhere in the early 30s, all right? It's disputed as to when exactly he was crucified, but uh, just say circa... AD, okay, it was after AD 30, maybe 33, 34, 35, somewhere in there. Okay, uh, there's a, there's a, a book of uh, some theologians, and uh, they, they would estimate that this story in Psalm, sorry, in Acts 9, when the Apostle Paul probably occurred around AD 36, all right, so Saul was converted approximately around A.D. 36. Uh, he wrote his first epistle, which anybody, I don't know if anyone knows what epistle was the first one that he wrote, but it was 1 Thessalonians, and that was written in 52. All right, then, okay, I'll put Thessalonians here. 62, he wrote the epistle of Philippians, and then, all right, in 68, he wrote, all right, in the spring, he wrote 2 Timothy, and in the summer, he was martyred. All right? So, okay, this is, so this is just, there's obviously a lot more things. I'm, I'm purposely identifying only a few of the things in his life here because it's going to be related to what we're talking about. Okay, now let's, let's look at our, our sheet here, and let's look at Philippians 3.10. Okay, this is a verse. Let, let's read this all together out loud again. It's good to read. There's a, a verse in Timothy that says we need to attend to public reading. So let's, let's read this publicly together. Philippians 3.10. To know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. Now I want to read you so keep in mind, Philippians is written down here, all right? This is, what, 26 years and six years before he was martyred, all right? Now I'm going to read you, this is the Amplified again for Philippians 3.10. you got to listen closely, this is really good. Okay, it says, For my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. All right? I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. All right? So, this is what... He was talking about 26 years, approximately 26 years, after he first asked this question, Who are you, Lord? So, he's still finding the answer, 26 years later. An apostle, written epistles, raised up churches, but he is still looking for the full answer to this question. Who are you, Lord? Alright, he is progressively, more deeply, and intimately being acquainted with the Lord. So that was what he wrote there in Philippians 3.10. All right? And uh, this, and, and again, the language is important. It doesn't say to know about him, to know about the Lord. I know everything about the Lord. That's different. But he said to know him. Right? If I say I know everything about Mario, I could have read something, you know, on the Internet, whatever. But to know, if I say I know Mario then that means we have a, we're close. Like, I don't just, I've been, I spent time with Mario, all right? I, I know him. And so it was the same with, uh, with the Apostle Paul. Now, he, 
Now, this knowing is it's an experiential knowledge. It's not a head knowledge. You know, I can know all about Disney World in Florida. I can know. I can study the map. I can know how much everything costs. But once I go there, then I really know right. Disney World in Florida, right? Um, I've never been there. So, but um, so what we're talking about is not a head knowledge. We're talking about experience. Paul knew the Lord in experience. This person. I'm going to skip now to the last verse on this sheet. 2 Timothy 1.12. Again, public reading, okay? Let's do some public reading. Let's read this out loud. 2 Timothy 1.12. For which cause I, so I suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to guard my deposit unto that day. All right, now, again, 2 Timothy is written when? In the spring of... 68, right before he was martyred. That's exactly right. So, what was the apostle saying here in his last, very last thing that he wrote? He said, in, in Philippians 3, it was to know him, indicating that he was still progressively becoming more intimately acquainted with the Lord. But here, in 2 Timothy, what did he say? I know him. I know him. All right? He could say, I know the Lord. So, you know, 32 years um, from the time when he first asked this question, Who are you, Lord? Then he arrived at his martyrdom, and his, his testimony was, I know him. I know him. Right? Isn't that awesome? Um, so this is what our life is. Actually, our life is just a quest. It's a quest to know the Lord. Um, the first, the most important question, the thing that should should drive us at the core, is this question of, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? All right, now, um, Philippians 3, 12 through 14, let me read this to you. All right, this says, again, same, this is here. All right, not that I have already obtained or am already perfected. Okay, most of us, I believe, we're past, you know, Acts 9. We've, we, we somewhat know the Lord. We've believed in the Lord. None of us are here, all right, can say, yep, I know the Lord. We're somewhere in the middle, all right? So that's why I'm hitting Philippians 3. This is what it says. I have not obtained, nor am already perfected, but I pursue. If even I may lay hold of that for which I also have been laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Now, underline the word pursue, all right? If you have a pen in these verses here, pursue. It occurs twice. Brothers, I do not account on myself to have laid hold, but one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and stretching forward to the things which are before, I pursue toward the goal for the prize to which God in Christ Jesus has called me upward. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Listen. The same word translated in English as pursue is actually the same Greek word as persecute. All right, it's the same word in Greek. All right, remember the intensity with which Paul was, Saul was persecuting the church, breathing threatening and murder, excessively persecuting, ravaging. All right, he used that same word, persecute, to describe his positive pursuit of the Lord in Philippians 3. So, intensity. All right, he was, he was, he was not just pursuing the Lord, but he was pursuing the Lord to a degree, in a sense, where it was almost like persecuting. All right? this, this probably happens with, you know, say movie stars or soccer stars or someone, you got people who are crazy about you, and uh, sometimes they just do, they go too far. You know, they might show up at your house or waiting at your doorstep, they're just like, just trying to take those pictures or whatever. That, that their pursuit of that person becomes a persecution because it's so intense. Um, so that's how we that's how we should be with the Lord. All right. It shouldn't just be you know, Mr. Nice Guy. You know, Lord, I hope I'm not bothering you right now. Actually, uh, it should be pursuing the Lord almost to the point where it, it's it's persecuting. It's almost too much. It's too much. All right. Breathing. What about breathing 
breathing loving the Lord and breathing enjoying the Lord instead of threatening and murder. All right. Now, I'm going to wrap it up here. But this is what is described here in Song of Songs. Right? In Song of Songs 1-4a, it says, Draw me, we will run after you. This is referring to our relationship with the Lord. First, you, uh, the seeker here prays, Draw me. Then she says, We will run. Not just walk, but run. All right? Run after you. All right? Sometimes if you're on Truesdale, you see someone who you haven't seen in a long time, you might run after them. Right? If it's some guy that you've had in class or whatever, you might try and say hi, but if he doesn't see you, not gonna, no big deal. But uh, to someone that you, you really care about, you, you run after them. All right? So that's what the seeker was doing here. Then, check this out. Song of Songs 3, 4a. Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let go. All right? Again, referring to our relationship with the Lord Jesus. That's a kind of persecution, right? Holding the Lord and, and not letting go. That's, that's, uh, that's loving the Lord uh, it, you know, in a very strong way. Okay, quickly. Um, just, uh, I'm out of time. So, one, one minute on what is it, how can we pursue the Lord? How can we have this seeking? We might feel, oh, I think this question is important, but I'm just, you know, I'm not Saul. I, you know, I, I am actually very interested in politics and um, more interested than in the Lord. Uh, that, that, that's okay, okay? All right, here's four things that we can do that, that are necessary in our pursuit of the Lord. Number one is we need to, we need to ask, all right? Ask the Lord if we don't, feel like this question is number one, let's ask him to make it number one. All right? Ask and you shall receive. That's a promise in the Bible. And there's a verse, Luke eleven thirteen. 13. Look at that verse later. It says, How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? All right? He will if we just ask. Uh, he may not give you a new Ferrari, but he will give you himself Amen. if you ask for more of him. All right? Secondly, as it says in the verses in Philippians 3 there, it's important to forget the things behind and stretch forward to the things before. All right, in our pursuit of the Lord, maybe yesterday was, you know, an awesome, you had an awesome experience of the Lord. That's good, but forget that. All right? Maybe you had a failure yesterday. Forget that. Pursue. Amen. All right? The Lord is new. He's new every day. Amen. Number three is we need to spend time. All right? Like in Song of Songs, it says, draw me. If we don't spend time with the Lord, we can't get to know Him. Right? Very simple. Uh, and then also, not just personally, but corporately, in 2 Timothy 2.22, it says we, we should pursue with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Again, that same word, persecute, pursue. It shouldn't just be us and the Lord personally. We need to do it together. All right? This is a corporate hug, you know? We hold Him and will not let go. All right? Then lastly, is uh, we need to come to Him in the Word. Right, so ask, forget, spend time, and come to the Lord. When we come to the Word, we need to come to Him. That's John 5, 39. Don't just, you know, read the Bible, but really seek me. Seek me in the Word. All right? So those are four things uh, of how we can pursue the Lord.